Hi, I'm Uncle David down here in Bolivia, South America. This last week I've been traveling across the Andes Mountains between Peru and Bolivia, and I, I had some time to read through some of the internet comments and the questions and concerns that you have sent regarding the video, even at the doors, which I recorded last week. I've tried to read through each one carefully, there's quite a few of them, and I have prayed for wisdom and uh, that God would give me divine uh, uh, wisdom to be able to answer and to properly respond to some of those questions that you have in some of your concerns. I came down to Bolivia to pick up a mission airplane and I have to prepare the airplane for the flight north, but uh, I, I believe it's important to address these issues right now. But before I address those issues, I just want to mention a little bit about my past. Um, I've been hijacked, I've been imprisoned, I've been assaulted by gangs, I've been beaten, and at each of those occasions, uh, I have felt God's presence at my side. I have served this church that I love for almost 40 years, 39 plus. And uh, this is probably one of the hardest things that I've had to do, and yet I have God's peace. I have a strong conviction that this message is something that uh, the devil extremely, uh, he hates, he fears that God's people will wake up and will get ready for what's about to come as an overwhelming surprise. But, but you have valid concerns and you have valid questions which I want to address. And I have God's peace and I, and I am uh, going forward in that confidence that the same presence that accompanied me throughout those difficult experiences will accompany me through the next uh, few months as we, as we wade through these difficult issues and as we prepare for what is about to come upon the earth. I, I, when, I love one of my favorite verses uh, in Isaiah 30, 21. Then your ears shall hear behind you the word saying, this is the way, walk ye in it, when you turn to the right and when you turn to the left. I am praying that God will help us that. I need that. I have to have it. And even though I'm, I'm trembling a little bit with fright over such implications, such important, solemn implications as a message like this has, uh, I want to assure you that I do have God's peace. I sleep well at night, and in spite of the difficulties and challenges and a little bit of fear that overtakes me now and then, I am uh, I'm able to address it with a sense of peace in my heart that I am doing God's will, and that uh, I, I, will, I will admit that uh, there are some issues that I need to learn, and uh, we'll talk about those in a minute. There's, four, there's four, three, several issues I want to address with you now at this time. The first one is uh, time periods and prophecy. That was some of the questions you had, time periods and prophecy. The next one was the judgment of the living. We will talk about that. The next was the National Sunday Law, uh, some handling of disagreements among the brethren. That's an important issue to discuss because uh, it was different reactions coming across the internet. I want to address that. And I have a commitment to make to you, a promise to make to you um, that I want you to know what I promise you. And then, uh, and then we will finish up. The first one is the time periods and prophecy. Uh, as, we look, as we look at um, what Adventists have been concerned about time periods, let's consider the following. So Ellen G. White told us that time will no longer be a test. In context, uh, every quote that she referred to refers to this uh, stating a date for Jesus second coming in context every time she referred to uh, caution against a time period that it will never be a test again it's about it's about forecasting it's about stating a date for Jesus second coming every single time in context and uh, the reason we know that it's about uh, Jesus second coming in addition to uh, reading the material that she had we can also I can illustrate it uh, for example, uh, in Revelation 8, verse 1, it says there was silence in heaven for a space of half an hour. All Seventh-day Adventists know what that means. That is Jesus coming. And during that, during that time, uh, there will be silence in heaven, which is a prophetic time period. Half an hour is about a week in prophetic time. And we believe it's a, it's a prophetic time, and it is future, and it is in the Bible, and we all believe it. So it's not that there won't be any prophetic times. Uh, there will be. And what about literal times as well? Let's, let's look at the next example. Uh, we have Revelation 17, uh, 17 12. Uh, the Bible says, Revelation says, that the ten kings will receive power with the beast for one hour. We believe that's also a prophetic time. And we believe that there will be ten kings that will reign with the beast for approximately 
two weeks during that one hour. That's another time period, uh, and it's also prophetic. We also have a third one. This is a literal one in Revelation 20, verse 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. In all of those verses, we read about a thousand-year period. Now, we know what the thousand-year period in heaven is. The saints will be with Jesus in heaven, will reign in heaven, and will we'll be able to review the books. That is a literal time period. It is future, and it will be in heaven, and we believe it. So here we have three different time periods, some prophetic, some literal, that are future, and yet, uh, and yet as we review it, we have to realize that we believe those, and therefore let us not be closed-minded when God wants to reveal further issues. I'm sure there's many more things that we can also look in Daniel and Revelation that we will learn. The last generation is going to understand Daniel and Revelation like no other generation because it wasn't present truth for them. It's present truth for us. And so the last generation is going to have an increased understanding of the events as they take place. And I believe God has a lot to teach us yet. And therefore, let us not be closed. We just automatically think things. For example, uh, the Lord uh, in the judgment of the living. Uh, here's an interesting situation with the judgment of the living. Now we're going to go into that. We just discussed time periods, and there are literal and prophetic time periods, but now we're going to discuss the judgment of the living. Uh, I'm going to quote uh, Ellen G. Y. Last Day Events, page 159. The Lord has shown me uh, what would take place just before the close of probation. Every uncouth thing will be demonstrated. There will be shouting, drums, and music, and dancing. We already have that. And, and what, is, what is going to happen? Right before the close of probation. That has entered many of our churches. I have seen it myself in South America. I've seen it in Australia. I've seen it in the U.S. And that is just before that precedes the close of probation. So we can know we're right at the very edge. That's one thing. And then we have the Sunday law. The Sunday law certainly is related to the close of probation. In fact, the Sunday law is the final test, first for God's people, the judgment must begin in the house of God, and then eventually it goes to the whole world. But the door closes for those that would not enter, but is open uh, to those that have never heard. So let's look a little bit about the Sunday law. Since the Sunday law is related to the close of probation, uh, we can learn some things from past history. You recall Israel believed, and they were looking for a Messiah. They all believed, including the disciples, that when the Messiah came, he would reign on the throne of David. Of course, he's going to reign on the throne of David. But they thought it was going to be then. So right before Jesus went to the cross, the disciples are still asking Jesus if they can sit on the right side or on the left side. Why would they do that? Because they believed Jesus was going to sit on the throne of David. And of course, a triumphal entry, when he came in that Sunday to Jerusalem, they knew for sure that it was coming true. But they didn't know. Jesus had told them many times. But their preconceptions closed the door to understanding. They didn't understand until afterwards. Could it be that Seventh-day Adventists also, we understand everything so well that we don't need anybody to teach us anything else? We already know. But that's why Jesus told us to watch. And he told us to pray. And therefore, as we discuss things that are a little bit different than we expected, let us be ready to take it to the Lord in prayer and Bible study because God has a lot to, it says we have a lot to learn and much, much to unlearn. So there's a lot of things, twice as much to unlearn as to learn, tells us the servant of the Lord. So Satan knows about the Sunday law. He knows that Seventh-day Adventists are sensitive to the Sunday law. And what he, know, he knows that if we wait until it's too late, he says if they wait just a little longer, their destruction is certain. Well, waiting a little longer means some door is going to close. And then our destruction is certain because when we wake up, we can no longer prepare. For, is there a Sunday law? Are we waiting for a Sunday law? Is there one in the pipeline? Or ha, are we being caught by surprise? You see, Satan has subtly disguised the Sunday law. Maybe we Adventists believe there's going to be a big sign someday. The president of the country will stand up and say, we will discuss the national Sunday law. Satan is not so stupid. He's not going to call it the National Sunday Law. That would wake up every Seventh-day Adventist. He's going to disguise it with another name, dress it differently, so that Seventh-day Adventists think there is nothing in the pipeline and it's far off. Well, I would like to tell you that he has disguised the Sunday Law and he has called it the protection of the environment and of the family. It's law on climate change. 
On June 18 of 2015, the papal encyclical called Laudato Si was released in June of 2015. Immediately in July 7 of 2015, a call was made for action in the U.S. Congress. The next month, August 5, it was introduced into the Senate. Tremendous amount of work was made. And then on September 23, we have the Pope coming to kind of clinch all of that work that was done. Now, I have a friend of mine called by the name of Don Frost. I talked to him today, and I just wanted to verify some of the details. He was there with a team of persons in Washington to protest the Pope's arrival. They were handing out great controversies, and I had a picture of the bride of Christ standing on the moon, a pure woman with stars around her head. Now, many Catholics think that is, that is Mary. Now, we know it is, it's, it's an image of the, the wife, the bride of Christ. So they were handing out this, and there was a bunch of priests, Catholic priests, walking by from the congressional building, and they saw that picture, and they came over. Some of them were dressed as priests, some were dressed in just normal clothes. Uh, and they introduced themselves, and they said that they were the advance guard uh, for the advance guard for cl on climate change. In other words, they had come from the Vatican to be able to meet with uh, congressmen, senators, and uh, legislators and decision makers uh, regarding the, the proposed laws and proposed plan that the Pope was bringing. And they were the advance guard. So they were there specifically to address the issues of cl the climate change uh, proposals. Uh, so Don was talking to him and uh, quoting him from, his com from a conversation he told me today. As he was discussing with him, he said, since you're working with uh, climate change, let me ask you about it. I've read, the, I've read that encyclical. And, and from what I can detect, it's not so much about the climate. It's about a day, a day for the family, and it's Sunday. It's about a day of worship. He said, it looks to me like this is about a Sunday law. You know what they responded to? You know what was their response to him? That's exactly what it is, quote. The law on climate change is none other than a national Sunday law disguised with a different name so that Adventists won't even know what's going on. How successful. Most Adventists are dreaming right through it. Most leadership doesn't have the slightest idea. Right under their very nose, it's happening. Now you say, how come there's been silence on it so long? Let's look at another quote from Ellen G. White. This comes from, uh, from one of her writings too. It says, the Sunday movement is now making its way in darkness. The leaders are concealing the true issue and many unite in the movement, do not themselves see the undercurrent, where the undercurrent is tending. Last day events, page 125. The next important point that we need to discuss is how to handle agreements among the brethren. There is rarely perfect agreement among God's people on every subject. We, we see through a glass dimly. We are still learning. The Holy Spirit is the one responsible to draw us together in unity. But how do you handle disagreements between brothers if you agree, don't agree? Many of you have written to me in agreement, others in disagreement, and in different ways you have responded. A Christian will humbly point out their disagreement and why they disagree. They will pray that God will bring us into unity of understanding and also for those with whom they disagree. A true Christian will also be humble and open to examine advice and all evidence, surrendering everything to the Holy Spirit's correction or confirmation. But there are some that attack and denounce because they don't agree with them, and that kind of reaction is of the wrong spirit. It's not, it's not a Christian response. Attack and destroy. Among Christians, we have to learn to work together. And even if we see things differently, God will be responsible. We can be sure that God has a way to correct his children. And if he wants us to be, think differently, he knows how to do it if we pray for each other. Of course, talking, dialogue, uh, and opinions with humility helps a lot. In the loud cry, I can assure you, God's people won't have all the same opinions, but they will work together in unity. The next point is about a watchman. I am a watchman on the wall. I'm not a prophet, I'm not a son of a prophet, and I have yet much to learn. However, as a watchman, uh, there are certain things that we must be aware of. For example, peace and safety is the cry of men who will never lift up their voice like a trumpet, says Sister White, to show God's people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. These dumb dogs that cannot bark are the ones who will feel the just vengeance of an offended God. Fifth, 
volume of Testimonies, page 211. And besides that, we have another quote from the fifth volume of the Testimonies, page 715. And it says, When the watchman, seeing the sword coming, gives the trumpet a certain sound, the people along the line will echo the warning, and all will have opportunity to make ready for the conflict. But too often, the leader has stood hesitating, seeming to say, Let us not be in too great haste. There may be a mistake. We must be careful not to raise a false alarm. The very hesitancy and uncertainty on his part is crying, peace and safety. I am committed, and I want to promise you, I am committed to sound the alarm and to give the trumpet a certain sound when I sense there is danger. If I make a mistake and I'm not exempt from making mistakes, I will be humbly open to correction. But I will sound the alarm if I'm convicted there is danger. Number two, I am a Seventh-day Adventist. I believe in the church and I believe in its mission. I have dedicated my life to s spreading the Advent truth and building the church and I will continue to do so. I apologize to you if I gave the impression to the contrary. I stand corrected. But our church is under a frontal attack at this time. Everything we have believed in, er every one of our pillars is under attack. And I am committed to defending the truth and its mission and to prepare God's people for carrying out that mission. Number three, with the Lord's help, I will seize every opportunity to preach the three angels' messages and use every resource that God places in my hand to accomplish that task. In closing, I am more convicted than ever that the probation time for Seventh day Adventists is about to close. We don't know the exact day. We don't even know the exact hour. We do know that it's near, even at the doors. If I believe this, put yourself in my shoes. If I believe this with all my heart, would I be correct not to present it to you? I cannot but sound the alarm. It's just, but if this message is of God, other people disconnected from me will also be sounding the same alarm. God is merciful and he will not allow the door to close without giving you a warning. The least you can do is wake up, confess your sins, ask God to eliminate all worldliness and to cover you with Jesus' beautiful, perfect robe of righteousness and to help you live in harmony with his instructions. Those instructions, you will find them in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Many of us have uh, decided to, to ignore those small details. We have allowed them to, because it's a long ways away, and I don't have to do that now. Don't allow anybody to interrupt you from that. Read, pray, and follow. God will help you. This is not the time to sleep. Sleeping will be fatal. That's why Jesus warned us so many times to watch, watch, and watch, lest coming suddenly he catch us sleeping. What else can Jesus do? Not only that, Jesus will give you the power to do it if you ask him, but we're living at the edge of time. You will then be ready for the final test whenever it should come, and his peace will keep you safe. There will be no fear. This is not a fearful message. This is a beautiful message. There's a great work to do and a very short time to do it. The midnight cry, the bridegroom is coming. Let us go forth to meet him. God bless you.